Coming up on this week's episode of the Ask Women podcast, we talk about emotions. Not a woman's emotions, but your emotions, which I know sometimes get neglected, either because you don't know how to express them, you don't know if you're feeling them, and you don't know what they are. So on this episode, we talk about emotions. What are emotions? How to identify your emotions? How to share your emotions? And why it's so beneficial with your life with women. So keep listening. Hey guys, welcome to the Ask Women podcast. It's your host, Kristen Carney and Marnie Kinris. And we just started... Oh, and of course, that's that was my alarm clock because I was just sleeping before this whole thing began. But anyway, uh, welcome to the show. We have... Wait, just, uh, the buddy, ho- it is 3, p- 3 p.m. your time. <laughs> <laughs> it is, so- but... It is, but I haven't been napping a lot lately. This is like the first one oh, this poor week. Baby. Poor baby. I know. I know. I know. It's dreadful. Mm-hmm. But we have <laughs> Dominic Portuccio from the Man Amongst Men podcast. Hey, Dominic. How's it going? Oh, it's been great, but you disturbed my sleep. I was <laughs> napping too. So. Tell me about it. Yeah, it's the word, the show up. always disturbs my sleep. Seriously. I'm sorry for inconveniencing you guys. We can definitely <laughs> get Brian back on the show if it's too bothersome for you. Brian yeah, is he's, Dominic's partner that we yeah, kick off of our show. <laughs> correct. And, and by, by partner, podcast partner, not oh, right, life not partner. life partner. Right, right, right. Because... But maybe soon, maybe one day, if the man stuff doesn't work out. Yeah. Or true. if you become like a really modern man, you could be fluid, ambiguous. I don't even know all the terms and, and <laughs> well, go in that direction. Who knows what the future holds. Yeah, that's right. right. Amongst water, yeah. Well, I did want to dive into some of the topics um, that... Dominic is very comfortable talking about. But before we just dive into information, I want you to tell people about who you are, why you teach men, what you do. And I know that the people who are listening have no clue what you teach, but I I want you to explain it first before we start talking about some of the topics. All right. So present day, I work with what I would consider high-performing men, men who are successful in life, guys who have it all on paper, who've lived life a certain way, and then are waking up to this new question of what is this all for, right? I thought that I was doing everything the right way, but I feel restless on the inside. I feel maybe trapped by the life that I've created for myself. There's not a lot of sympathy for a guy like me because, right, like other people tell me that I should be grateful for my life. But these are the men who are starting to feel alone. They're starting to feel like there's a greater sense of purpose out there for them. And they don't know where that's at. So I run men's retreats for these guys. We do adventure retreats in places like the Rocky Mountains. You mentioned Brian. Brian and I have run a podcast called The Man Amongst Men Podcast, where our goal is to really awaken men to these areas of their lives they haven't inspected. Their sexual beliefs, their patterns, their habits, their connections with other guys, how they compete with other guys, you know, those kinds of things. And the way that I got here, and I'll just give you the nutshell version, I spent 15 years in financial services, kind of living that default life of, hey, as a guy, what you're supposed to do is go out, find a job that's sturdy, that can give you good money, that you could be successful, climb the ladder. Did those things, worked really well. But... I also found that there was like the hollowness somewhere along the way that caused me to question. And the big event that I'm sure we're going to get into that really caused me to look deeper inwardly was about six years ago, I entered Sex Addicts Anonymous for a period of four years when I got caught at the time cheating on the only woman that I'd ever loved in the 35 years that I'd lived on this planet. And hitting a bottom so low and my private life being so different than the per- the part of me that I presented publicly mm-hmm. just really caused me to look at everything. And that actually was a, the birth of a new beginning for me. Okay. Well, we have to then ask this question, of course. Is sex addiction really a thing? I knew you were, were going to just... say that. Of course I was. We've never had someone on before who's had to go to sex rehab mm-hmm. or whatever. Oh, it would poor be. you. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know what? The, the poor you uh, begs the question of like, what do you think about when you think about a sex addict? Like, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Oh, uh, well, with me, it's going to be, you know, a dude who likes to fuck and wants an excuse to make it 
okay. But, you know, I also understand the mental health side of things to an extent. And so it could actually be an addiction or feeding some sort of emptiness that you have inside. But you tell me. Yeah, no, it's, I'm always curious about it because it's one of those quote unquote addictions that I think there's a general lack of understanding around it. I, I'm actually unsure if sex addiction is actually a thing. We had a doctor on, on our podcast. He's a preeminent sex, a sex therapist for men. And he has written books on why sex addiction is a complete myth. And one of the things that he will, he will say is, if sex addiction is actually a thing, then we would see prevalence of that outside of Western civilization. Like we diagnose it here, we call it sex addiction. There's a whole therapy around it, but it doesn't exist in other countries and other parts of the world. And so if it's just geographically located, then it's probably not an addiction. That's his argument. Okay, interesting. Well, I would say just based off of the amount of people in the world, it is an addiction. There's like 4 billion of us. Well, can, can you... So it's an addiction in that well, can sense. you walk me through what it is? Because maybe I don't have a full understanding of the life of a sex addict. Like, is it like... Very similar to a junkie who needs sex so badly that he's, or he or she is going Mm. to the slums of the world to get whatever he needs for that fix? Or is it a guy who's just like, okay, I want to go in every night and my night is not complete until I have sex? Or is it, is it both? I I, I just don't have a a full understanding of it. Or what was it for you, I guess, is a better question. Cool. So Going into the sex addicts meetings, they're 12 step meetings that follow the same protocol as, say, let's say, Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, Narcotics Anonymous. And there's obviously some tweaks for sex addiction. But in the room, you know, where there's, it was mostly men, it was like 99% men. There's other, there's other groups primarily called uh, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous that had like 50 50 men and women. But in the group that I was in, sex addiction, 99% men, you had a wide range wide range of of reasons why men were in there from guys who were in there because they were addicted to pornography and it didn't go any further than that. They just right. couldn't stop beating off to, to porn. And, and some of them weren't even in a relationship. It was just like, I need to stop this. It's consuming my life. There were other guys in there who were at the extreme end of the spectrum that uh, do the things that you get arrested for. Right. right? Like things that are uh, like, like violent to other people and horrifying. Right. And there was everything in between. So I remember having a grave resistance to going into a 12-step meeting for the fact that I, when I'd done research, even before I hit my bottom, because I thought there might be, like I might have had a challenge, I, I didn't want to step anywhere near those rooms for fear of being swept up in that, that broad stroke. So for me... Or they would try to have sex with you or something like that. <laughs> you know what? That was, that was less of the fear. Uh, and and the most, most of the fear for me was was like being being discovered that I like I was broken right. or that I needed to go to a place like that cuz I I worked like at the time this was 2013 I was a corner office in in Times Square running a sales organization that had a 1.4 billion dollar sales goal my life was built around performance right. having my shit together I was a leader of the organization and and showing any any sign of of weakness whatsoever um, was like a like kind of a death sentence for me. Right. So the way that my sex addiction worked, and I think the best way to answer that is to kind of go back in time a little bit. Like I, I did this whole podcast called "The Making of a Sex Addict," and it's it, it's my life story. Brian does a whole bunch of questions around, like okay, you know, from from an early age all the way up to present day. When I was a young kid, maybe some some people can relate to this. When I was like eight years old and I was at my house watching a movie with my parents and it would turn into a movie where there was like a woman taking her top off. I remember being really excited about that at the same time as my parents would be lunging right. across the couch and being like, cover your eyes. Oh, then I'm a sex and- addict. I, don't, I was excited too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. I was definitely scared. <laughs> <laughs> scared of what part? Your parents like wrath or no? Just nudity. <laughs> nudity. Oh, nudity interesting. Me. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for me, I was like, I want that, but then my parents would shut it down, and it, there'd be this tension in the room. Right. And then I would go to Catholic school, and I'd mm. be told that, like, you know, sex before marriage is a sin, and all of these natural feelings that I had at a very early age. I'm like, oh, they, like they're not welcome at home. I'm going to hell for feeling these things. And yet at the same time, it's like such amazing feeling that like very early on 
what I taught was okay, what I was taught was okay, and what I felt and what I wanted were two very different things. Yeah. So automatically, I kind of had these two worlds. At teenage years, when I discovered this thing, this magical thing called masturbation by accident, which no one ever like talked about. Right. It was like I was sitting on a pile of heroin for free. I could pull on this crank at any time and get this magical, blissful feeling I could be taken away. And I was a sensitive kid. I just changed schools. I didn't know how to navigate my emotions well, right. like the one way to numb it out. It just became, you know, fantasy, masturbation, Victoria's Secret catalogs, right. you know, those kinds of things. That, the reason why I share that with you is because like very early on, I had a public Dominic, a private Dominic. The private Dominic was the side of me that I thought was sinful, that I couldn't show to the world. I thought I could be punished for it. I could be ostracized for it. And at the same time, it was the only thing that helped me to navigate my emotions and my insecurities, my overwhelm. It was the thing that actually allowed me to survive the stresses of day to day. Now, interesting. go 20 years like that, like, and that's kind of where I was for decades. And as I was playing these bigger games at work and in my life, the way that I navigated and, and dealt with my stressful situations was I could pop on my phone and start sexting with women. I would bury myself in my room on a Saturday afternoon in my mid 20s, like dealing with a hangover. I'd just be on porn all day or sex messaging with women online all day until it was time to go out again. I didn't even, you know, I didn't even realize the depth with which this was affecting my life and the way that it showed up for me. This is the, I appreciate your patience and getting back to your original question. When I fell in love with this woman and she was the only one who was able to kind of penetrate these two worlds, you know, and, and like see me. No pun intended. Sorry. Okay. For the bad pun joke, intended. Sorry. I do. Okay. I know, listen, but Brian and I, there, there's <laughs> like, we, we, we've just come to grips with the fact that the words, like that anytime we speak, double entendres are just going to be yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a the way around that last right there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So please call me out on those because I enjoy, I enjoy them just as much <laughs> okay. as anyone. We'll make it a drinking game. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> The, the woman that uh, I fell in love with, we were going on our very first vacation in Colorado. And it was December 28th, 2012. Uh, we check into the hotel and she, I, I, I'm in the bathroom. I come out of the bathroom. Her face is pale. She's holding my cell phone. Mm. And she threw it at me and I opened it up and it was basically like to the string of text messages that any girlfriend would be horrified to see. And it was as salacious, pictures exchanged, fantasy scenarios with another woman. What she didn't know was that there were probably a dozen other women in the phone where I was having those same kinds of exchanges. I'd cheated on her physically three times. I'd never cheated on a girlfriend in my life. I never thought I was capable of it. And this woman who was the most important woman in my life, even though my love for her was growing, at the same time, I had 20 years of dealing with my emotions in this very specific way, right? which was porn and sex and sexting and validation from women. And even when I tried to like stop it, I could curtail it for periods of time. I would make a promise to myself. I'd be like, oh, I'm going to stop watching porn. Stop for a month. I'm going to stop sexting other women. Stop for a month. And then I would repeatedly break my own promises. And so it culminated in me, fortunately, getting caught so I could actually address it. And that's how it showed up for me in my life. Okay. Interesting. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. My pleasure. Yeah. It's all, it's all interesting. And I'm guessing that people have very similar stories. Not, not to that extreme or maybe to that extreme, but it is interesting how you use that for soothing yourself and you relied on that even when you were in a relationship and getting those wonderful things from that person. So with that backstory, with the guys that you work with, I know that you do a lot of talks and groups about how men can openly talk to each other about stuff. Because did you find that that was one of the areas that you were lacking or missing? Because we've talked about it a million times. Women have so many outlets. Women are encouraged to talk to their friends. They're encouraged to talk to their peers. They're encouraged to talk to uh, everybody about their emotions. But men even still today, are kind of shut down and not really meant to have emotions, even if it's about sex. So did did you find that talking to this group shifted things and then to segue into 
how can men start to openly talk about this stuff with other men or other people and feel comfortable about it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I had never spoken openly about any of this stuff to any guy and because for all the reasons that you just mentioned. And I, I remember walking into my very first Sex Addicts Anonymous meeting feeling like I had all sorts of judgment around the men in the room, like looking around at them, judging the shit out of them and thinking, oh, you guys are the ones who are fucked up, not me. Right? Like, I'm, I'm just going to come in here. I'm going to figure out the things I need to do. I'm a high achiever. 90 days, I'll be out of here fixed. And I remember I had the, the blessing of, a, of an amazing sponsor, a guy, so, you know, someone who basically is like your guide in, in the 12 recovery program. He looked at me and he said, Dominic, like, you come in here and you're competing with all these other guys where they're not competing with you. They're trying to figure out a way to support you. Right. Right. Like, you're judging them and they're trying to connect with you. And he's like, you're not used to this because like most men operate in environments where like whenever you get around a group of other men, it's like, who's the alpha dog? Who's the threat? Who's the guy that is beneath me? There's like always this hierarchical jockeying for position. And the sex stuff, unless it's like, you know, telling some story about the the woman that you nailed or like this crazy scenario, like most guys are like not interested in hearing it. So there's not a lot of room. Mm -hmm for any of these more meaningful discussions. So absolutely, like I'd never spoken about it before. I I never aspired to be a guy who talks openly about this stuff, especially given the upbringing that I have. But I just kind of found that through my own transformation and through sharing my story in private places, I could see how many... Um, private places. I'm surprised neither one of you jumped on that. <laughs> well, I just took a shot. I couldn't talk. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> in these private moments, like where I had an opportunity to share some of this stuff with other guys, like I could see how desperate they were to open up about like these questions that they had. And, and then I, I ended up getting the courage to run this event in New York City that one of my, my mentors, her name is Lisa, she was like, you got to call it the discerning dick. <laughs> and I run this with Brian. I run this like this workshop in New York City called The Discerning Dick, Sexual Wisdom for the Modern Man, where we invited men and women to come together to have these discussions. It's a discussion geared towards men. And half the audience ends up being women because they're you know very much intrigued right. by guys who are talking about this stuff. They're sex and we addicts. talk about stuff like... <laughs> no, well, I'm kidding. I'm, who, who, who the girls, the women. The women. <laughs> like, let's see, no, I'm yeah. just joking. But okay, I, I do want to interrupt you for one second, because so, you said something yeah. really interesting about two minutes ago. You were talking about they, they, these men were trying to connect to you and you were talking differently and you were judging them. And that's how you had been programmed to talk to other men before. Can you explain a little bit about the difference? And, and, and then also how you can still connect to people without turning into a, a wimp. Because I think that's, that's the biggest fear for so many people is losing their edge or losing that upper hand or getting walked all over and, 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 and seeming needy to other people. So can you speak totally. to that? I'd like to understand that a bit better. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Like my perception of guys who, who did this kind of stuff, like went into 12 step meetings or who did men's work, like my image was always soft, effeminate dudes wearing flannel will have, have a beard are in the woods, hugging and crying each on each other. Like that's just, oh, that's my just vision like how is so I thought different, of it. But I, I hear you. I understand. What is it? Well, it's like what is your sort of scrawny men with mustaches <laughs> and dancing around and then talking about their, okay. even though I'm I, like, I don't even know why I would ever think that. But when, when you say like a men's group, that's my first vision for some reason. And I know yeah. it's not true. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that, that is exactly like what Brian and I are, are, are aspiring to change is like, what's that, what's that vision? Cause I had that same thing. So what's the difference you were asking? Like, what's the difference in listening? Traditional male listening, the way that we've been kind of trained to, to engage with each other is sizing this other guy up. It's like, where are this guy, when he's speaking, it's, do I trust him? Where are his weaknesses? Is he, is he more desirable than I am? Is he someone that's a threat to me physically? Is he someone that's a threat to me emotionally? Who has the upper hand? What's the power dynamic? These are, these well, are like things that are running thing, in the background. Right? It also sounds pretty similar to the women I know, but I also don't know very much. Right. I was gonna, I was gonna say that too, but it, it's a biological thing that that's built into you from thousands and thousands of years. So right? Right. I think part of that for sure. I think okay. part of it, but part of it's also like conditioning. You know, like for example, like I went, I, I grew up playing sports. I I grew up 
going to, I mean, in college, I was in a fraternity. And a fraternity, like it's, it's, you know, like you talk about, like I, I was, I was a part of a fraternity that there was a healthy dose right. of toxic masculinity oh, in there. That's strange. Where was, in a fraternity? <laughs> right. Oh, you would never no, think. Never. Very surprising. No, no. And it's, but like, right. you know, you spend four years in that environment and even, even the most awakened right. guys can get jaded. Right. And, and then like in some of the programming. So anytime I entered a room of guys, it wasn't a conscious thing. It was just like a sizing up of. And what I ended up finding was what these guys were, when, when, they, when, they, when they welcomed in a newcomer, and that's like someone who's like a first timer coming into a meeting, they basically like attune their listening to you in a, like in a heightened way of, I really want to hear this man's story. I want to, I, like, I'm extending compassion and support. I want to see just trying to get in your what pants. parts of That's his story. really what it was. That's a tactic. Fake interest. Did I miss that? Did I miss that? Yeah. It's a good move. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. So naive. Yeah, like, what, what, what they're really trying to do is, like, what parts of this man's story are very similar to mine? And, like, where could I lend some support to this guy? Where, where is he in his journey? Um, and how could I guide him to the next possible? Like, I just wasn't used to that level of... And even, you know, and, and even your jokes, Kristen, I think that may be you. It's like, you, your jokes around, oh, they're just trying to get in my pants. Like, that is a, 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 like a, a natural homophobic reaction that many sure. men have when they experience compassion from another guy. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're just, you're gay or you're trying to get in my pants. And they immediately mm-hmm. push that away versus like understanding that in a healthy masculine relationship, those are the strongest men in the room. Right. Well, it seems like the guys who go through something and then come out, come out of the other side and have character built are the ones that are going to be willing to listen. So it seems like you almost have to start at where you were, which is the kind of frat world, judging, sizing everyone up. But you have to go through something to get to the other side. It's like, I don't know if you would get there without having to go through something, you know, because difficulties build character. Yeah. I agree. But I think everybody has their own difficulties. It may not have to be something so extreme. Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah. Well, so, so I have a question. So how can men start to experience this form of sharing without freaking out the other men in their lives. Like for you, you went to a space where things were going to be uncomfortable. It was expected. You didn't know how people were going to act or react to you. And you can adjust to it because it's, it's, you're there to be learning. But in the real world where you're just interacting on a daily basis, because I think that even for men who don't have sex addiction or maybe don't have no addictions at all, talking to their male friends or even male colleagues about things on lower levels are very beneficial. So ha- so what are the baby steps to start doing this on your own again without freaking people out or having them think you're gay or having them think you're too soft or having them think you're a wimp? I just I want to know yeah. how how guys that are listening can utilize this because I think it's wonderful without being shunned. And that's sad that they would be shunned to be honest, but it 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 happens. Mm-hmm. But it's it's it is how it is, and 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 so I remember when I was first starting to ask these deeper questions, like wanting to explore different ways of being, and I, I remember not feeling that I could bring this to my immediate circle of friends because it it just like for all the reasons that you just talked about, right? Feeling like worried about being shunned. So for anyone who's like out there listening, who's like, okay, I do want to have this conversation about say sexuality, or I do want to have a deeper conversation about insecurities or right. fears or whatever it is. It's oftentimes, I recommend going outside of your circle completely, going outside of your circle completely and finding places where like people do this stuff. So for example, like the men's, there are men's retreats that I recommend highly that may be a step too far for people right now from where they are, but like, let's just start here. Uh, The Mankind Project is a group that's been around for uh, 30, 40 years, and they have a program called New Warrior Training. Right, it's like th- this is the opposite of the the scrawny guy like dancing around in a circle. Like these are men who are coming together to like really go inward, deal with like these emotions of anger. You beat the shit out of some stuff, not not human beings, but stuff, and like and are are, are like called forward by other men. The Every man group, which has been around for a couple of years, they do like weekend retreats. These are all like pretty reasonably priced too, where their their mission is to help men 
navigate their emotions. Because most guys, like, we're only been trained to experience, experience anger and everything else is like not welcome. Right. But emotions are data, man. And it's like, if you can learn how to tap into your emotions, you have fucking power. Right? You have fucking purpose. You can be magnetic to women when you are stepping into that place of power and emotion and you need to go and do that work. So if you're curious about that stuff, like those two places, the Mankind Project, Every Man, and they, I know Every Man has a podcast I don't know if the Mankind Project does. My podcast, The Man Amongst Men, like you could hear guys talking about this and we always recommend books or online forums and stuff like that that you can go and get more. Okay, wonderful. I want to take a quick break and then I want to come back. I have one more question for you and then I want to answer some questions from our listeners. So we'll be back in a minute. You know how you came here to this podcast for excellent expert advice because dating on your own is tough? Well, guess what? Here's the opposite. You don't have to be an expert to help out your own credit situation because right now you can get a credit card consolidation loan from my friends at Lightstream with a rate as low as 5.95% APR with auto pay, which is much lower than the average credit card interest rate of over 19% APR. That means you can save thousands of dollars in interest, which is a lot. And guess what? You didn't even need any expert help. You did it on your own. Truly, if you're struggling with credit card debt, you're crazy for not doing this. You're just letting your money just slip away. So just for our listeners, if you apply now, you get a special interest rate discount. The only way to get this discount is if you go to lightstream.com slash askwomen. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash askwomen. All right, we are back with Dominic. And the one question that I wanted to ask was... How does expressing your emotions, being aware of your emotions, benefit you with women? You touched on it right before the break, but I want to hear for you specifically, how does this benefit you? How does it make you more attractive? How does it make you more confident? Does it make you more attractive to women? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So think about someone like me who lives my life out loud, meaning that I I'm pretty public about the fact that I spent four years in Sex Addicts Anonymous yeah. and I've done a whole podcast on like some of the transgressions. And so my stuff is out there in an honest, authentic way. And yet women trust me because there, there's a certain way that I'm living that women can feel I'm not bringing an agenda. I'm not bringing manipulation. I'm not bringing a lack of awareness of my behaviors, actions, and emotions. So a very specific way to answer your question, Marnie, is the way that I lived my life for probably the first 30 years was I needed, a, I needed female validation, sexual validation primarily, to make me feel like I was worthwhile, that I was valuable. Right. And I became a master at learning how to navigate a woman's emotions where she couldn't bring it to any other man but me. I could listen I could help her solve the problem if she wanted to, or I could just listen if she wanted to. I could be a rock and sturdy support for her. And that all worked. I was like this white, like the white knight on the, on the horse that over and over again, I could forge deep relationships with women very quickly, but then I would get overwhelmed by the emotional burden that I'd assumed. And I would get resentful of having to navigate those emotions on a regular basis. I wouldn't communicate that to her. I didn't even know that I was going through that. I would just chalk it up to, she's too emotional. And then I would quickly find a way to exit stage left. And that became a pattern year over year. That's why I couldn't keep a relationship. That's why I never fell in love with somebody for the first 35 years of my life. Didn't even know it. And then when I started doing this work and I recognized that like when I started to feel that emotion of feeling trapped or overwhelmed by her emotion or resentful, that I could actually, instead of isolating and collapsing or pushing her away or shutting it down or avoiding a situation altogether, I could actually speak to it. I could actually have the conversation with her and say, you know, a specific example could be, I know that you need me right now for this issue, this challenge. I'm burnt from the day and I want to be there for you and listen fully. What I need is a half an hour nap or something like that. I will come back to you fully with my attention at that point in time. And by the way, here's what I need from you also. Because I could never express my own, like what it was that I needed. I just 
you know, if I could, if she wasn't naturally given to me, I just would go get it somewhere else or right. I would shut down. So yes, right. that's... So you didn't know how to express it. No, I think that's amazing. So there's so many guys who are like, but I am so nice. I do listen. I do share. I am their shoulder to cry. And I'm already doing that stuff. And I completely understand people who are feeling that way. But I will say that a lot of people recently have been writing to me who are in relationships or they are married. And they're basically saying, my wife hates me. She's tense all the time. She's angry. Doesn't want to sleep with me. What do I do? How do I get that spark back? How do I flirt with her? And so for most of those guys, I tell them, if you flirt, she's going to hate you more because Mm -hmm. it means that you're totally avoiding what's really going on. So flirting is not going to help you. It's going to get you divorced. (laughs) But what you can do is exactly what you're talking about is is like learning how to attune to her emotions and not either belittle her or put her down for her emotions. And that is, it's a huge skill set to have. So a lot of this information may not, I mean, it will be helpful for you, for the people who are listening in the beginning stages of dating and relationships, for sure. Always being in touch with your emotions and expressing your wants are definitely beneficial at all times in your life, whether it's with women or without women. But being able to acknowledge emotions, identify emotions, understand emotions, be empathetic, these things are absolutely necessary if you want to have a lasting relationship with a woman, coupled with being able to flirt and to be bold and all the other things that we talk about on the show quite often. But, and Marnie, can I, can I just give you one thing yeah. for, the, for the guys who are saying, yeah. you know, my, my wife and like the long-term relationships? This has come directly... We, we've gotten amazing coaching from some of the women in our community who say, most guys will initiate sex like two minutes before they want it, right? Like they will initiate foreplay like two minutes before they want it. And usually that's not the time frame that works for a woman. And the example that you just gave about, you know, like my woman, my, my wife is too, she's busy, she's doing too much. She's like, you know, running around doing a million things. We've been told that stress hormones have a direct impact on sex hormones. Mm-hmm. So if someone is stressed out, if like if, if your partner, if you're the woman in your life is stressed out, because she has a million things going on, her sex hormones are suppressed. So the way that you can become, that, that you can create those conditions is to become a magician at reducing her stress. And if you can become a magician at reducing her stress over a longer period of time, it's like foreplay. But the foreplay needs to happen like consistently. So, it, you know, whatever it is, like if she comes home and the kids are like screaming or if she comes home or you come home and she's been with the kids all day, like what are those little things that you can do to just show that you can give her those moments where she can care for herself, those add up over time. And when that adds up over time, there's an opportunity for you to connect with her on a, on a potentially sexual level. Amazing. Actually, can you give some examples of those things, of what they can do? Because I'd love to hear what, what you advise people on. Yeah, I mean, well, so we're, we're taking these directly from some of the women who have shared with us. In some cases, let's say if, if, if you're talking about a working mother or even just a, a stay-at-home mother, who's been responsible for the kids most of the day, what she, all she may need is like 15 minutes of her time. Or like you more. can... She needs a little more. I'd say at least, at least four hours. <laughs> Six hours. I was going to say four days. I'm trying not yes. to intimidate you. No, but, no but, but, but what you're saying is that this would happen on a, on a daily basis so that you would have time built so up. after it's 10 like years, it would three end weeks up. in a row. Right. No, sorry. I don't want to drive I want to hear what you have to say because it's interesting. Yeah, start with 15 minutes, work up to four hours, and then four days. <laughs> I, I would say, like, it, it, but, it, but it's like the energy behind that, right? So if, if you think about, it, it's like, she's not expecting this, but like you pull her aside and you're like, hey, honey, for these next 15 to 30 minutes, just maybe give her a specific time frame. For this next half hour, go into your bedroom or go into the bathroom, draw a bath. I've got the kids. And don't worry about a thing. And then, and then just like making it that simple and she'll be like, but I got to do this. I got it. I got it. Like go to the bathroom, take a bath, take care of yourself. I See, I, the best is it ever. immature of me? Because I would immediately think, oh, really? You're giving me 30 minutes. Wow. Thanks. Thanks. I'll start the timer now. Is that, am I, am I a terrible woman for feeling that way? Or is that how a lot of women would feel? No, I would feel that way too, but I would take it. And then I think I would get more used to it. It's when you haven't been given that for a long time and somebody hasn't identified that maybe you need that, that it becomes sort of bitter. It's, yeah, it just, you're not really sure how to take in that information. So my first reaction would actually be to get defensive as well. But if I were to have that 
continuously and maybe have a deeper conversation about why my husband is doing that, then I, I could, I could see his angle and not be as defensive towards it. Okay. So yeah, if, 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 if like the, if the reaction is defensive, then obviously this is not landing the way that it's intended. So I'm curious about what would trigger the defensiveness in response to that The time offer. limit. It's almost like a child and a parent says, okay, you have to be back by 11. You're, but you're both adults. I think it would work better if it was, honey, go run a bath, go take care of yourself, and don't explicitly say you have 30 minutes. In maybe 30 minutes, go check in and kind of maybe subtly hint that like, let's rejoin. You're going crazy downstairs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right. Mm-hmm. I just think putting the time limit on is Perfect. a little bit harsh or sounds harsh. Maybe it isn't as bad as it sounds. So this is this is what's really interesting about these conversations because the the women that I'm usually working with, right? These are like VPs, senior VPs of Fortune 500 companies, where they are terrified to take ten minutes. See, for you just talked to a girl who's napping before the show started. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point. So, but but like, but you can you can see how these things like need to be communicated, right? Mm-hmm. Because like I like so the like the women who. I'm talking, they would have bristled at 30 minutes because they'd been like, oh my God, that is so much time. Selfish. Yeah, but oh. Right. That's so much time. That's selfish. I can't do that because of all these things yeah. that people are depending on me for. Yeah, so, that, that's like, what that's how I would move. think. I would be like, that's a lo- it's defensive because I'm like, okay, I, I I there would be so many things going on in my brain. I don't want to do that to you. I don't want to stress you out. I don't want to take that time because I should be giving to my children during that time. So yeah, it, that that would be my reaction too. Yeah. So that like the the point here is like make an offer that is based on the information that you know about your wife and and like her lifestyle and what may like land with her and also be open to the response because in 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 like in my thinking when I offered that up as a suggestion it, it I didn't even recognize that it may be it, it may trigger defensiveness but the fact that you were able to bring that up brought a deeper level of understanding to what you need and now I can cater that conversation and those actions based on what you need. Okay. And when do, when do you express what you need? Because that sounds very wearing on the man if he is constantly taking care of her emotions, which is wonderful and that's what you should do for a partner. But how does he also express his wants? Yeah. At first, a guy needs to get clear on what he wants. It's, it's often, I often find that when I ask that question to, to men, it's like, what do you want? And they don't really know. It's like, I just want peace and quiet. Or yeah, I want, want her sex. to stop being so unhappy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it, it could be, it could be those those, those simple things. It, it could sound like that, and it's like, okay, well, I'm just thinking about one of uh, one of my clients who's you know working with a he has a, he has an amazing partnership, but they also are quite volatile with each other, and he has a hard time expressing his needs. And one of the things that we just talked about, which was he's got a lot of work coming up, and she wants to spend every day having lunch with him. And he's got to stop his work every single day. He's, he's creative, and and like go to this lunch with her because that's her expectation. And I, we coached him to say, "Honey, I love you, and I know we're going on this vacation in in fourteen days where I want to be like fully present with you while I'm there, not worrying about my work that was incomplete. And what that means is like for these next few weeks, I need to be heads down on on the work that I'm doing." So that means like for these next few weeks, the lunches I can't be stopping for. I need to work through them. And like to be able to express it that way from a place of power versus like exploding once the stress has got too much on him right. is, is a very different way for him to communicate and for a lot of other guys. Or, or like the way he would have done in the past is kind of just to continue to eat that shit sandwich right. and been resentful showing up and being angry at her. She wouldn't have known why. Right. And that's what happens in a lot of relationships. And that's where the tension comes from. And that's where a lot of these men that write to me, that's where they're at. They're at that point of really their wife hating them at that point. It's like min- it's like 10 minutes in a week where their wife actually likes them and gives them any attention. So I, I love mm-hmm. all the things that you're saying because it can get you back to that wonderful space with each other, just being able to express yourself, identify your wants. They're really important things for any and all relationships, whether you're at the beginning of one, the end of one, you have a sister, you have a brother, just being able to communicate in a kind and clear way is really helpful to to anybody that's listening. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I love it. Okay. I want to do one question 
from our listeners. And just give me one second. Oh, actually, you know what? There was this article, and this is not at all on topic to what we're talking about, but I thought it was kind of interesting. It's about women dating men for food, for just to have a free dinner. And I, mm. <laughs> I wanted to know... From both of you. Kristen, have you ever done that with a guy? No, no, I'm not that hungry. Right. <laughs> if I got hungry enough, maybe. <laughs> have you ever heard of women doing that? Of just I've, going out? I've heard guys talk about women who have done that, but I've never known any women who do that. I think it's Neither just so I. much energy to put in to just get a meal. I would rather actually work a job. You know, and put the energy in there and be able to buy my own meal. Right, for an hour and then go have a nice right, meal however right, you okay. want to eat it. I agree with I you. I'll go buy something. Right. I don't, I, I don't know in the real world if that actually happens, but obviously it has to. It does. It does. Like they, there was an article where women were like, yeah, I've done that every once in a while when I've just gone for a free meal. Well, you know, actually the Black Dahlia who was murdered, this is, I know sounds very random, in the 40s in Los Angeles was... People would say she was like a hooker or, you know, sleeping with men. Um, but she was really actually only getting dinners with men and never actually sleeping with them. Oh, really? Yeah, I went on this like ghost tour. It's really interesting. Uh-huh. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. <laughs> kind of weird. Yeah, but she was essentially like a dinner slut. And some people's theory is that's what got her killed. Mm. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Too many free dinners. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just buy the fries on your own. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with you. Okay, I just wanted to bring that up because it was something that somebody sent to me and I'm like, oh my God, are women really doing this now? Okay. Yeah, well, I think there's, I think the men that this is happening to are missing giant red flags because I have a feeling that the women that are doing this aren't showing a lot of interest, but they're responsive when it comes to, do you want to go out and get dinner with me? You know? Right. And all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, love you. Yeah, tell me more about sure. you. And then they shut down after that. So I think, They just have to keep their eyes open for very, very obvious signs. I agree with you. Okay, let's let's get to the one question from Ryan. Uh, Longtime listener and follower, I'll do my best to make this an email short. I've always had confidence and managed over the last four years of being single to have an unusually great single life. Talking to women or attracting women, someone I have my eye on is not usually a problem, but I've gotten myself into a situation and it's professional. I am filming a short film, which one of the scenes is being intimate with one of the actresses. She's exactly my type. I've always enjoyed being single and don't see myself even dating, but this woman has me has me for some reason. So we have to drum up chemistry for the camera. We need to act very, very into each other, which is great. But where do I go from here? I feel if I let this go too, for too long, shooting in four weeks, I'll miss the mark, but I don't want to let her know there's anything and make her uncomfortable doing the scene. Doing the scene with her would be fine. Trying to get her attraction would also be fine. But the two together is throwing me for a loop. Unless I just finish up the scenes and try after. We also live an hour or so from each other. So running into each other isn't possible. Thanks for everything, guys. Ryan, what do you think you should do? What do you think his question is? His question is, can I go for it now? And will I mess everything up if I do? Yeah, and he's the director? It's, no, it sounds like he's the actor. Yeah, so I think he's, he's, in he's going to be intimate film. with her. Yeah. He's an actor. Okay. Porn star. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a porn star. Then go for it, buddy. This is interesting. I would, okay, well, I can actually kind of speak to that in a little sense because I actually did a scene not too long ago playing a guy's girlfriend mm. and he was definitely into me. But it was just a quick one and done. It wasn't like a long, you know, we didn't have four weeks to wait to actually film it. It was like, are you available tomorrow? Yes, I am. Ba-da-da. So when I got there in the short micro time that we have comparatively to what this guy has, we did cute little exchanges because I think he was already into me, but you do want to have that chemistry. And if you want to do a good job acting, you have to go a little method. And so he can always fall back on that excuse like, oh, I'm just a method actor. (laughs) Like I actually live the character. And so if he maybe takes it too far, he can jokingly fall back on that or seriously fall back on that. And then, you know, once it's actually over and done with, you've already established a playful, flirtatious dynamic without taking it too far because you haven't like grabbed her by the pussy or something. (laughs) Um, And so then you leave the door open for that to happen. I wouldn't go for it beforehand, but I would definitely set the stage with playfulness and blame it on the the role. 
Okay, interesting. Okay, Dominic, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I think, what I want to make sure of is that he's clear on on what he wants because I, I don't, I didn't hear a direct question. This goes back to like getting very clear on, like, does he feel Ryan? Do you feel like drawn enough to this woman that you would make a move if, like, let's say there, there was no movie, right? And you would just like you would definitely want to ask her out. If that's a yes, then I do think that you have something to consider, which is this. You, you are both entering a professional environment, one where you both want to, Kristen, like your, your, your guidance, which is like to play into that so the chemistry on screen is dynamic, but also not to go so far as to create a situation where she may be uncomfortable because maybe she doesn't feel the same way and, and not to put her in a situation where she feels like um, that she has to respond to you if, 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 if like for some reason she doesn't feel the same way. So I suppose what I'm, what I'm getting at here is if you first get very clear on what it is that you want and you feel like you can do this in a way where she feels respected as an artist and then maybe like you can be very communi- clear in your communication with her either before or after the, the show is, the, the, the scene is shot so that she knows what you're about, then I think like you've kind of covered your bases. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of, uh, what am I trying to say here? Lying, I'm not like a, I suggested. Yeah, <laughs> of, 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 yeah, like I, I, I suppose. Misleading, right. kind of. Misleading, yeah. Like, I, I, like I, I would want you to really own what it is you're looking at and, and to say like, hey, do you feel the same way? Is there this chemistry? And she may just say, yeah, like let's, let's play the scene out first, see what happens, and then I can get on the other side of that and then I'm like totally down with it. But you. if there isn't the chemistry and she's like, no, then they get in the scene, then he's in his head, she's uncomfortable because she rejected him and the whole crew's watching and you know, there might be a boob involved so she's even got to like <laughs> expose some sort of body part. I would just hold off and I don't think it's necessarily, necessarily misleading as much as it is putting off for the future. There you go. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I kind of agree with yeah. that. As George Costanza would say, it's only, a, it's, it's not a lie if you believe it. So, <laughs> if you believe yourself <laughs> and you know you're not doing something wrong, then go with it. There you go, Ryan. I, I can, <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Good answer. Uh, all right. We are coming up at the end of our show, but I wanted Dominic to tell people how they can listen to him, how they can do a workshop with them, uh, with him. So, please. Yeah. The the Man Amongst Men podcast is the podcast that Brian and I run, and we have a bunch of topics on there. So um, we did a, an entire one on pornography and how to do a, an abstinence period, period off of that. If you're interested in more sex addiction, and you can listen to my story about the making of a sex addict. And yeah, we did another one on sexual performance, just like some of the hangups that guys have around Oh, amazing. Staying hard and, you know, like what they've learned from porn and how that doesn't translate to reality. So there's a bunch of those on there that I think guys um, would get a lot of value out of. Wonderful. Okay. And Kristen, how about you? Well, actually, speaking of porn, I don't necessarily know if it's the same, but I just had on my other podcast, uh, Michael Raspoli on my show, who's an actor, and he's currently in um, HBO's The Deuce with James Franco, oh, which cool. is all about the sex industry in the 1970s mm. and 80s back in in, the, in New York City. And it's super interesting. So anyway, I've been watching it, but he was on my show. He, not that he really talked about sex, but he is on that show. So if you guys want to listen to him um, and check out his show, you can come over to Kristen and Chill and, uh, and check out my podcast with him. I love that. And if you want to find out more about me and my teachings, my method, go to winggirlmethod.com. I will teach you how to attract date and get any girl you want. Uh, this was a really good podcast. I found myself listening for for most of the time, which is very rare. <laughs> Shocking. No, yes, but I, loved it, it. I loved it. I, I loved hearing everything that you had, had to say. So I think it's really important information. So thank you for being so open with us, Dominic. And tell Brian that um, if he comes on, he's got, He's got a really high bar to reach. Yeah, did. seriously. Awesome, so. <laughs> seriously. Uh, I will 
I will set that bar for him, and I'm sure he will leap wildly over it. <laughs> I'm sure he Perfect. will, too. I'm sure he's weeping right now. Um, <laughs> new episodes of the Ask Women podcast come out every Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific. I now have them on YouTube, which hopefully by now you know about. But if you want to go watch slash listen on YouTube, go to youtube.com slash Marnie Kinris, and there's about 300 other videos on there of me telling you exactly how to do things step by step. And if you want to send in questions for the Ask Women podcast, please send them to ask at askwomenpodcast.com. You guys are awesome. We'll see you next week. 